September 4th, 1867. Today, we left for Lower Fort Garry, a York boat laden with cargo for the company. Our companions are fresh-faced Highland laddies, harnessed beside the brown-skinned Cree. From dawn till dusk they toil on a diet civilized society might not consider fit for dogs. The days of these ancient Homeric struggles are nearly over. But with God as my witness, I have seen the proud passage of the York boat and witnessed the glorious journey of their company of adventurers. On a spring morning in Winnipeg, in the year 2001, Jamie Brown is looking for a new company of adventurers. He's producing a television program to recreate one of those glorious journeys. Three, one, two, three. All right. A York boat has been built which will sail from Winnipeg to Hudson Bay, if the right crew can be found. More than 500 people have applied for a seat in the boat. Jamie will pick just eight. We're trying to make it as close to the experience out there as possible. This is a kilometer with 182 pounds in your back, and, and the longest portage is 1.6 kilometers. A lot of them are shorter, but they'll have to basically do this. And the, the trip men carried two 90-pound packs on their back, and in fact, some were reputed to have carried three, which um, after carrying this, I, I, it seems hard to believe, but uh, I guess they could if you did it all the time. My hips, by the way. She's struggling. She is really struggling. She's got lots of guts, but she's struggling. It's not only guts Jamie Brown is looking for. Can I use the railing? Yeah. 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 Y
did have very, very Mike Scoops is the backup in case someone quits really or is injured. You guys have amazing, amazing talents um, in a lot of things, and uh, we're really looking forward to seeing them come out on the trip. Our whole goal is just it's got to be period appropriate, and it's cool. got to be, you know, what a typical boat would have. Right. And there's a real sensitivity out there in the audience about, and what they love about this is the challenge and the realness of it. And the more we work to make it real, the better it's going to be for everybody at the end when the audience sees that, you know, you really did do this unbelievable undertaking like Yorkman. There you can drink the water. The water and it will be an unbelievable undertaking. 1,200 kilometers of lake, bush, and whitewater, from the 21st century to the 19th, driven relentlessly northward by courage, history, and teamwork. In that sense, I would really feel uncomfortable with one person having a veto over what the other seven feel. Uh, amongst eight people, we can come to some kind of consensus where, you know, through discussion, and that uh, people will all feel comfortable. I don't think we have to look at it as a veto so much. Now to discuss it and uh, make sure you make the right decision, because there's no... Uh, a rapid is unforgiving, like you hit a rock and spill us over, or the Smash end of the, the boat, boat. There and that's it. All of us at one point or another is going to have to face a, a fear. Whether or not, you know, it's a wind or waves or water or uh, rapids or bugs or the unknown. You have to approach it logically and respectfully and cautiously because yes. it's always in control. Like, no matter how powerful you think you are, I mean, you can never outpower Mother Nature. It's what it is. There's almost two types of respect here. One, respect for each other, uh, and, and, the, and the respect for the terrain and the water that we're traveling. Their quest will be to travel deep into the heart of Northern Canada, tracing a centuries old fur trade route. Starting in Winnipeg, they'll follow the Red River to the inland sea known as Lake Winnipeg. Crossing to its east side, They'll row 400 kilometers to the Cree community of Norway House, where they'll turn northeast and struggle through the beaver dams and swamps of the Etchimamish. Finally, they'll enter the Great Hayes River and fight their way across its many rapids until reaching the York Factory Fur Depot on the edge of Hudson Bay. The York boat was the transportation backbone of the fur trade. It opened up the north during the 18th and 19th centuries, as the bush plane did in the 20th. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Three weeks before departure, the crew meet their York boat for the first time. That's exactly what I, exactly what I envisioned, wow. a big solid honking boat. Oh, <laughs> Team member Paul Gosson has arrived. He's a part-time river guide and full-time optimist. It's going to be very interesting. Okay. <laughs> Stop! Good. Need another board. One, two, one. E. Get ready up here. It's going to keep going. Yeah. Forty feet long, eight feet wide, weighing over a ton. The boat was handmade in Manitoba from spruce and tamarack. By the time the journey is over, it will have taken on a personality of its own and played an important part in the lives of the crew. It will also have saved some of them from serious injury. Larry Duncan is a member of the Cree Nation and York boat expert. He's been hired to teach the crew how to handle the big boat. The first bit will probably be the, how, how the importance of rowing together as a team and they got to go through the rhythm, the technique of the rowing. So some of these guys, I know they're kayakers, they're salesmen or whatever, they, and they got, to, they got to work as a team, and that's what you got to do first. You got to get them into the rhythm. York boats are tough to row. They're heavy and unforgiving. But Larry knows his business. His message, work together and respect the boat. Kevin, is it Kevin or one of you guys? Is Pull harder, you're not pulling hard. <laughs> when you're not rowing, you could pull your oar in, okay? Pull the oar in, pull them in, that way you won't, it'll, it'll be, the oar will be safe. You gotta take care of your oar all the time. That's most important. That's your, that's your machine that's here. Yeah, that's the motor here. Okay, push this out, Lottie. 
Watch me go out to dip your oar in the water. The oars alone weigh 50 pounds each and are not for the faint of heart or weak of muscle. Okay, great. When they pull it, you got to pull it. Come on. Go, be focus all the time. Concentrate. When that oar will pin you. Very. It'll knock you off the water, off the boat. When that happens, you gotta, you gotta swim. That oar and you pull it hard, pull it up as hard as you can. But either you or that oar will break. Lock and guard, guys. Lock and guard. First week is gonna hurt a lot. It's gonna hurt every morning when we get up and start. I honestly think after a week, maybe ten days. It will settle into a like a pattern. Our muscles will settle in, and I think we'll be all right. They're a cheerful group who think all they need is a bit of practice. Let me move my seat. Most either canoe or sail, but none of them have tackled a journey like this before. What they lack in experience, they more than make up for in enthusiasm. Seasoned calloused hands. Oh yeah, there's, see, there's a blister right there. Actually, a little broken blister. Yeah, I'm gonna lose my guitar calluses and well, pick up rowing calluses. We're gonna be stacked. We're gonna have big, big muscles <laughs> if everything goes well, because it's, it's, uh, it's all about rhythm, I think. Once we get our rhythm going, it's gonna go well. And we've got a good teacher. It'll be a little different, I think. Um, I've never really been on an extended trip with only men. It, there's always been, uh, actually it's been mostly women or, you know, mixed men and women. So it, the dynamic will be a little bit different. Um, but I think I'll fit in okay. Uh, the guys seem really nice. And um, I think my biggest concern is that I can hold my own physically. That's obviously going to be the biggest challenge for me. I love the thought of, of surviving by partly by wit and by, by strength and, and by tenacity. Um, and it's I've always I've always liked the, the idea of, uh, of facing tough tough challenges. But Larry Duncan knows what lies ahead. The route is anything but easy. The most important thing they have to do is to rely on their higher power, to rely on the God as they believe in Him. That's who they, uh, each morning before they take off, they should be grateful for what the, that God has given them, what to do. They give them all the strengths, they give them the tools, the body, the mind, and the spirit. And they, when they rely on that, they should be able to make it. July 1st, launch day. In a routine familiar to boat crews across the ages, job one is to stow the gear. York boats carried about three tons of cargo. This one carries the same. The crew have also been given extra clothes, a pipe, and one blanket each. They pack light because eventually they'll have to portage everything on board. Well, I don't think we need to worry about it staying dry today now because we got the sponges and as soon as we see water starting to lap those boards again we'll, we'll start sponging it out. Crew member Rob Clark is an investment analyst from Vancouver. He's a mountain climber not a sailor and is worried about the boat. Well it was a little disconcerting to find that after pulling the boat out yesterday and uh, um, patching the hull that we had about a foot of water in the bottom of the boat and some of the food that we thought we had high and dry got wet. But uh, we did some quick repairs this morning and we're hoping it'll be more manageable. It's Canada Day. Thousands of well-wishers show up at Winnipeg's historic junction of the Red and Assiniboine Rivers to bid them farewell and to hear Jamie Brown describe the life of the 1840s Yorkman. Today, eight intrepid individuals will start a 1,200-kilometer journey that will take them all the way to Hudson Bay as they retrace the traditional fur trade route. Their diet will consist of lard, dried meat, and dried berries in the form of pemmican, 
bannock and a few potatoes washed down with some tea. I'd like to introduce our team of Yorkmen, starting with Ken Albert Jr., Rob Clark, Jeff Cowie, Paul Gossen, Maritz Lunenberg, Kevin Mustard, Randall, it's just standing in the back here, <laughs> uh, and Rosanna Schick. I'd like to toast to a safe journey. Godspeed. Go Clusters. Godspeed. How are you going to handle potential conflict between uh, crew members? Keel hauling. <laughs> We've got Ken here. He's our enforcer. If anyone gets out of line, they're overboard. The media treat the New Age Yorkmen as stars. This is their first time in front of the cameras. And they handle the transition from obscurity to celebrity with grace and humor. Things like that. Are you leaving toilet paper behind you? I'm afraid so. It's going to be pretty rough. So how do you hope to deal with that particular problem? It's a very practical one. <laughs> well, they gave us a little cloth, but after you use it the first time, I'm not sure what you do after that. I think it'll be more a matter of looking for moss and leaves. <laughs> how are you doing? Uh, anxious to get going. Just really want to get out and, and start rowing. <laughs> I'm buddy. Oh, yeah. Bunch your nose. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's be nice to get going. Get away from everybody. Row, row, zero. Veteran television director Don Young has joined the crew to film the voyage. I don't think uh, I don't think anybody's ever done this before, and it'll be something I'll be extremely proud of to have been part of. Boy, I hope I hope this all works out okay, because there's so many unknowns out there for them, and uh, I think they're ready though. Push off that side, and then the current will take us out, and then we'll draw that line in at the end. Okay? Okay, good. Very good. All right. There we go. My name is Gordy Ross. My age is three and thirty. I'm a tripman for the HBC. My work is hard and dirty. Sometimes I ache onto my bones. My work is hard and dirty. My father was an ordinary man, a fur trade man was he. My mother was his country wife, a woman of the free. And I was born to the fur trade life in 1843. Oh, the river flows, the free wind blows, the seasons pass away. And the wild geese fly in the autumn sky. But they'll be back someday When I was but a young lad I joined the company I worked the York boats hauling fur for 10 cents a day I broke my back in a York boat for 10 cents a day And when you're in a York boat The work is living hell Thank you. Sort of a, I guess a mix between just the adrenaline of getting in the boat and going, and the excitement. Thank you. And I guess the sadness of, of leaving yeah, family yeah. and friends, but the excitement of being with, you know, a new family and new friends here. Rosanna, you had a good turnout. Oh, oh man. Yeah, yeah. 200 people there with the last name Schick. Just about. <laughs> they all had the same razor sharp wit. Oh. Yeah. It's mixed. It's nice to see all the public support and enthusiasm for this venture, but fanfare and whatnot, it's the antithesis of what we're looking for in this wilderness experience. It was uh, getting kind of emotional at the end there. Never had so much family out for myself. My brother's usually the hero, he's the hockey player. So it was a different experience for me. A different experience? Ken Albert Jr. did not know the half of it. 
as he rode away from his place in time and sailed back into history. When these guys did the trips, they knew, they knew, they didn't, they didn't, like we'd be a bunch of rookies in a boat without a captain. They knew, they knew which way to go on the lake. They knew which way to go on the rapids. They knew they didn't risk, they wouldn't have risked their, their valuable furs. And you know, it makes perfect sense to me. Like they, they knew what they were doing. And the fact of the matter is we, we were going in blind and that's scary. But that's what's gonna make the show, I guess. But like you guys think about it, would you wanna risk something like that to go to to accomplish something and risk risk your life? Like it's gonna be so dangerous. I just hope no one gets hurt. just concerned about the amount of water and how we're going to end up having to contend with it. But if we're taking 60 gallons in right now, an hour, while we're rowing in this nice placid stream, what are we going to what are we going to have to contend with once we get out to the lake and we're actually dealing with two foot and three foot waves? Crossing Lake Winnipeg is on all their minds. It's stormy and dangerous. A bad place to be in a leaky York boat. Long supposed to come out. Okay, let's make it works. The other way? No, it no, no, it's because you're airlocked. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. The boat is stocked with everything they'll need. The rations are sparse, but period appropriate. And on their first morning, a lunch of bannock and water tastes not too bad. Thank you. Like many things on this journey, this will soon change. We're going to become such bannock aficionados. I like Randall's bannock It is a morning of firsts. First leak in the hull, first 1840s meal, and first time to try raising the sail. The York men must get used to it. They'll use it a lot. The fur trade crew sailed whenever they could. It cut down on the pain of rowing. The mast is made from a small spruce tree. It stands 20 feet. The sail is a 14 by 12 piece of canvas. No one's quite sure how the boat will handle with the wind in its sheets, but all admit, it sure looks good. A country church on the edge of the Red River is their first stop. The crowds are still curious, but the Yorkmen stay away. They're not here to sign autographs, but rather to pay tribute to the memory of a long dead fellow traveler. Okay, we're at uh, St. Andrew's Church on the Red River, and this is the grave of Isaac Cowie, my great grandfather, who was the one who came down in 1867 via the York boat. So this is his final resting point. I think there's some uh, words to live by on the bottom of your stone there. What does it say? Can't quite read it on. 
Only be thou strong and of good courage. Good words to live by. Only be thou strong and of good courage. Oh, little message for you. They'll need plenty of each before their journey is over. And yeah, for me, the family connection is really neat because uh, it's the sense of full circle almost, you know, coming to, uh, to reenact and to relive one of my ancestors' uh, journeys. sort of check all the seams again because some of them have sprung quite honestly I'm a little bit disappointed in myself for not being able to spot the uh, spotting some of the seam leaks but you know we didn't have the weight at the time so the way the water the boat was lying in the water where I wasn't really sure no. Maritz Lunenberg is a man who does not mince his words he says the boat is leaking too much and isn't safe in order to fix it, they must drag it ashore. Okay. It's the afternoon of their second day. Maritz knows his way around boats and has taken charge. He's never worked on a York boat before, but is sure he can repair this one. Our first little bruise here, if you want to look at it. Nothing big. We'll just have oh, to... no, that's from the rocks from yesterday yeah. on, the, on the shoreline. Yeah. What we hit was this. Yeah. It's coming in right in the joint. Yeah, right here. York boats were made by hand. Almost all of them leaked. This one has a knot hole in the bow, which has caused the problem. No, that's tar. Leave, leave that. But see this? Look. Maritz also decides to make a few improvements of his own. So what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of all this stuff. <clears throat> yeah, you know what you could do? You could take another chisel, a nice and sharp one. There's a good one. And do that, leave that one alone. That one was redone. There's one uh, further down we were looking at it, remember? It's all silicone lower yeah, down. Right. See, this one's also no good. Are you going to have enough oakum for all this? <laughs> <laughs> you cut that out. <laughs> you just cut that out. Like so we don't want to eat it. Yeah, I can do that. There. There's a little baby. This boat has no captain, and the crew work at their own pace. Like everything else, the group dynamics will soon need some repairs. The tools they've been given are originals from 1840 and work well. In a sense, uh, starting to craft all over again. Chinking or caulking, as they used to call it, was actually a, one of, probably one of the most important trades of putting the boat together because, hey, let's face it, we're keeping the elements out. They fill the holes with oakum, which is like horsehair and lots of tar. But no one's done this sort of work for a long, long time. So they do what sailors have done across the centuries. They fix what they can and hope for the best. Fascinating work of the Yorkman. We just sort of figured, that's it, let's tighten it up, do what we can and hope that uh, whatever happens as far as water is concerned and, and swelling is concerned, that it'll take us up to uh, Norway House in the river. And if we have to take a look at it again, we will at that point. So, but we're off. Over the next months, the task of keeping the boat afloat will rest on Marit's shoulders. It will be a heavier load than anyone could imagine. For me, it's it's painful, you know. It's I put a lot of I put a lot of uh, yeah love and care into him, and, and now I just see him, and I just sort of feel like I wish I was a vet and could give him a, an anest, uh, you know, uh, euthanize him and just say that's it.
On a Manitoba morning in early July, dawn breaks with the sailor's sky. They're at the edge of Lake Winnipeg, but a north wind has kept them shorebound. Rowing the York boat is hard work, and the nights are no easier. Plagued by mosquitoes, their sleep is fitful. Today's wind is a mixed blessing. It slows their journey, but keeps the bugs away. In 1840, the fur traders were paid by the speed of their passage and would probably have rowed onward. But on this day, 21st century caution wins out over 19th century courage. Trying to get the boat off the beach and figure out another place to put it so that it's not going to get pushed up on shore again, so that when we do want to leave, we, uh, we're able to. Let's not make a big production out of it. Well, we can try with block and tackle, it's fine with me. That'd be, be an interesting thing to try. So, like, what are we going to do when we're out in the lake and we have nowhere? The only thing we'll have is the shore. Yeah. We're going to have to learn how to do it. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Compared to fur trade vessels, this York boat is average in size and weight. The crew are strong, but handling the boat in the growing wind is not easy. Let's give it a yank. That one's coming out of the boat. Okay, so that one's going to be the line that gets... That one you just let go of the loose end. This is the one that... This is a skill they must learn. If they reach the north, they'll move the boat through the rapids by rope and muscle. Paul made soup, potato soup, which is to die for. Better than you get in the finest restaurants, for sure. Check it out, yeah. Thick and rich and hearty. Well, that'll be the German in them coming up. From the looks of it, I'd say we're going to develop like uh, 50 or 60 kilometer hour winds. And you'll start to see it up on the white caps on the lake. It'll start to pick up. And once this front goes away, we're going to end up with a nice, I, my guess, is a nice clear day tomorrow. I don't, I think also there's no, there's no uh, choice really, like, it would be a shame to stay here another day, but if we can't row, we can't row. There's no real sense in rowing 10 kilometers and breaking our backs over that. <clears throat> but I think there's a strong sense in the group that we, we should go tomorrow, but again, that's we have to be kind of wise in our choices of when to go. Yeah, and most efficient use of our energy. Because it's not just the rowing, you got to take down your camp oh, and set it up thing. again. you got to think where you're going to land. Like that here. all takes time. Can you imagine how intimately they knew their, their boat and how well they could do things? They would know exactly how far they could push it because they had to. Yeah. Often, and then they often would have had many accounts of people paying the price for pushing it too far. Yeah. See, that must have been a very particular there goes the oh, Keep on going. pushing your mule. Uh, Earn your porridge. Uh, Push. Push with your porridge. Watch out for those. All right, so those arms are going to get sued. <laughs> The distant world of the 1840s Yorkman was not without its rough-hewn beauty. And with the wind at their backs, 
the first morning under canvas on Lake Winnipeg is passed in peaceful contemplation. How's our balance? Are we off? As they settle in for a lazy day, they have two small chores. Get some breakfast and name the boat. Who's got ideas for names? Gretchen? <laughs> Somebody knock him overboard. Pay no attention to the man in the back of the boat. <laughs> well, back in 1840, this used to be called Rupert's Land. Oh, Rupert's a good name. I like that. Kenny, do you like Rupert? Oh, you just want to be difficult. You just want to be a. You just want to be an individual. I'm not a big good Rupert guy. fan either. No. Do you like the Hudson? I mean, what about it's a the great Pemmican? name, but doesn't excite me. The Hudson, because that's where we're going. People will, yeah. in, like in the show, people will identify with that big time. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, more than they would Finley. I mean, or Rupert. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, or Rupert, yeah. The Hudson, who's for the Hudson? Okay, if we have to go for name Hudson. Yeah, Hudson. Ken? Well, Ken gets his way, man. <laughs> what a tactician, eh? <laughs> Slide that in. He <laughs> <laughs> snuck that one in under the sail. <laughs> <laughs> back there at all, Kenny. I'll just lie back man. here and I'll just... Sailing. Randall, are you okay with that? Uh, yes, excellent name. But Hudson doesn't stick. It is soon replaced by Bob. Beautiful old boat. Day five into the trip and we've broken out the pemmican in its uncooked form. So you know we're into the rhythm of this trip when we're eating this without any condiments or preparation of any kind. To my understanding, it's blueberries, an enormous amount of lard, buffalo meat, and maybe some buffalo fat, I, I think. but. Uh, I don't think I could tell the audience what it tastes like. <laughs> and we're going through a lot of sugar. I think we're just going to eat what we want and see what happens. And, you know, if it, if it turns out that we run out of sugar, then I guess we deal with it at the time. But right now, we're just trying to adjust to the food. Um, so we could use more sugar. Potatoes and onions are going through pretty rapidly. Um, it makes the pemmican taste a lot better to cook potatoes and onions. Don't the bl blueberries cut through the lard? Yeah, they give the lard a little blueberry flavor. It's like a little, it's like a, a little piece of heaven in that sea of lard. That's just yeah. no, it's uh, it, this stuff is an issue. I mean, it's it's edible, fried, but in this raw state like this, presumably though, your great grandfather ate this in the York boat. You know, ate it. I guess, and that's probably why. To my knowledge, he didn't take another trip on a York boat. <laughs> For thousands of years before Jeff Cowie's ancestor arrived, the Cree traders sailed Lake Winnipeg. They called it Mr. Hay Sakagan, the Great Lake, and told tales of its beauty and its treachery. Uh, share with us why you, you think that. I think if we go across, it might be a late night. Yeah, we might be a little bit tired, but we're going to save ourselves an enormous pile of work tomorrow. I mean, if we get around the point of that little chunk there, it's only, uh, what is it, another half an hour or an hour, 45 minutes right to the, uh, well, we're in Heckman. I mean, you guys know how to read the skies better than me. What is this guy telling you? It'll be like, We'll hit the shore, there'll be waves slamming into the back of the boat, and it'll be like a while until we move that sucker up because we don't, it's not like we got rollers prepared or anything like that. We'll have to go out, cut down some trees, if we ever even want to think about rollering. And then if we don't roller it up the beach and the, the uh, surf takes it along, and it gets sideways, it's just going to get pounded 
the bits. into the shore. I mean, if the whole group wants to go, then we go, I suppose. But I just, you know, think we need to be very cautious. And... What's your opinion, Jeff? Well, I think to err on the side of being a little conservative and peek around that corner and see if we can get in somewhere. Lake Winnipeg is notoriously unpredictable, and sailing the York boat in heavy seas takes practice. The boat also continues to leak, and the bailing never stops. Unknown. I think we should go this way. The weather worsens as the storm approaches. The crew cannot make up their minds whether to be cautious and camp or to take advantage of the wind and sail on. What does the group say? Group six here, okay? Come on. Take it fast. Taking the island or what? The fur traders ran their boats with an iron fist. On this York boat, decisions are made by consensus. Jeff. Full speed ahead. Damn the torpedoes. Yeah. The superhero team. As part of the making of this program, the television company provided life jackets for all on board. The Yorkmen of 1840 would not have had any. Their errors of judgment were often fatal. You want to go to your port? Right, back. Oh, right. Captain! There. there might be some beach in there. Just head us straight. We'll take a look when we get closer. I just think that we should have, I mean, we had a great day. We had a great wind, and we took full advantage of it. But I also feel that we need to also know our own limitations in the day and realize that we have, you know, we have to find a place to to dock this boat because we can't just dock it anywhere and we, we learned that today that we need to take time to stop and you know figure out our camp and, and where we're gonna where we're gonna camp so i think that's just the you know the oversight we made today is trying to get too far too fast well i don't know it doesn't look like we got a lot of options here is there any room for a shelter ah! okay that beach is not an option then right That means we got to roll around that shoal, right? Or we go back this way. As the light fades, the sail is stowed, and the search for a place to land becomes urgent. Down she goes. I think you want to go in right beside that rock, that one in the middle. Yeah, I got it. Port paddle. Are you going up? <laughs> At nine o'clock, a beach is found, and the crew must quickly decide whether the mooring is safe. But the shore is rocky and the waves heavy. With the weather worsening, the boat is in real danger. Uh, I guess I guess they feel it's too rocky, too gonna be too hard on the hull. These guys say they know of a spot a little further along that uh, might be a little better. Maybe we jump on board. Back on board. The joy of the morning has been replaced by the grinding hard work of rowing the heavy York boat through the thickening seas. There is no training for a situation like this. Survival becomes a matter of experience and luck. Portside, row hard, okay? By midnight, they are lost with only the moon to steer by. There is no possibility of summoning help. 
their fate in their own hands. Day one on Lake Winnipeg has lasted 18 hours. And for the first time on this historic quest, exhilaration is replaced by fear. Stop rolling, starboard! Trail your Kevin, okay? Trail your. Right ahead. Yeah. Get more to the right. Quite a bit harder. Break, break starboard. Come on, break, starboard. All out, board. Everyone, get in. 